what makes you not want to do testing? Um, one, like testing, you know, I think like in the jiu-jitsu world, it, it's changing a little bit, but it was like very, at least one of, from when I came about, when I was coming up, it was very frowned upon. Like, man, you test, you, you, you do the moves, uh, without resistance, you pay, and then you get the belt. You know, people, basic people are like, yeah, you buy your belt. Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a fifth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's also a four time Pan Ams champion, a no gi Pan Ams champion, and an Abu Dhabi Pro Trials winner. He was also a New York Open gi and no gi champion and a Boston Open Absolute champion. He was a two time national Brazilian champion and a three time Rio de Janeiro state champion. He was also a professional MMA fighter and a veteran of the UFC. He's also an accomplished judo competitor, having won uh, major state titles in Florida, the Sunshine State Games, and the Miami-Dade Open. Uh, he's also the son of the legendary Master Holes Gracie. He has two academies, one in Lake Mary, Florida, just outside of Orlando, and one in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today for the second time on the show by Holis Gracie. How are you today, Holis? Right, I'm good, man. How are you? Great to catch up with you again. It's been so long. It has been for a very long time. I think it was 2017 or 2018 that you and I spoke last. This is all pre-pandemic, pre-craziness. Uh, we, have, we have a lot yeah. of catching up to do. It's great to have you back. Man, so much, so much. <laughs> First and foremost, there's two things that have happened since we've talked last on the show. One, you became an American citizen. Huge congratulations on that. That's really yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then thank second, you. secondly, you've now got two academies. Last time we spoke, I think you were teaching at one of Henzo's academies and still running uh, an academy in Old Bridge. Now you've got one yeah. in Florida and one in New Jersey. So congratulations on the growth of your school. Awesome, thank yeah, you. Yeah, catch us up. What have you been up to in the last few years other than those two things? Man, it's, uh, yeah, it's um, been a... Uh... A lot of things happening, you know. I uh, think when I uh, when I spoke to you last, I, my my school in Old Bridge was like we're just starting it, you know. It was maybe recently open or on the process of opening, uh, depending when, because I think we opened in uh, October of seventeen. So depending when our podcast was, so it was like right then or like a few months later. Um, but the academy grew a lot, you know. Um, you know, got a good crew there. Of course, pandemic came about, tried to wipe us out, but we stood strong. We endured it, kept growing. Um, and yeah, um, and then in, uh, you mentioned that I became an American citizen. That happened like in the in the pandemics, you know. Uh, pandemic was bad for a lot of people and bad for, for, for the country, but in the world. But in uh, in 2020, I became an American American citizen, and that was great. No, <laughs> so was that great news? Uh, 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 then um, I always I always loved and embraced American culture. You know, I think um, you know, and um, I think what makes people uh, Americans are you know the uh, how you embrace the what the the foundation of how this country was built. Right. And that's, um, you know, and that's why I consider myself, you know, these days I consider myself more American than Brazilian, to be honest. We're happy to have you as a citizen. I yeah. think that's, that's outstanding, man. And it's really cool uh, seeing people like yourself come from other places and, and, and have success in business, too. Like like we said, you've grown your school now. You've got two locations. Holdis, what do you think is the, is the most difficult thing about being an academy owner? Because there's a lot of people listening right now who probably aspire to become black belts and someday maybe even open a school and become teachers. What are some of the things that have surprised you along the way that you didn't expect that maybe have been uh, difficult about owning a school? Man, I always knew that this was just a matter of time for me to be a, a, um, an academy owner, right? And I, and not only when I was teaching with my cousin Hanzo, as well as I was growing along, I knew that was eventually I was going to have my own. So I, I've been preparing myself for uh, that way. The same way I knew eventually I was going to, 
fight in MMA. Or at that time, it was like Vale Tudo or No Holds Barred. You know, at one point, I was going to have to represent the the the, the Jiu Jitsu uh, 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 art in a, you know, in a, in a, in a No Holds Contest, uh, 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 No Holds Barred Contest. So I always knew, right, that I was going to have my academy and, uh, and I always had an eye to see, like, you know, every, everywhere I went, even before I had my academy, I was, like, doing seminars in some places. I was always learning some stuff, you know. I was, like, picking people's, you know, brains and asking them uh, about their business, about how they run things, the format of classes. And I'm a very critical person. So I think that also helps, you know. So I was able to put, like, the, the pieces together. I like this. I don't like that, you know, the... the the picture on the wall looks great, you know. This style, this I don't like. Oh, this one's a look too dirty. The other one's clean, you know. So all these things. And plus, we were a part of uh, the big transformation on Hensel's uh, Manhattan School, right? We uh, Hensel led us to implement a new system there for to be able to bring jujitsu to to everybody. So we tried to, we implemented a, a system that was like very, very user friendly for, for beginners. Because Hanzo was all, Hanzo's place was always, uh, you know, a, 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 a battleground, you know, a testing ground for, and always like great fighters came out of there. Always. You know, by one point, uh, we needed to, to grow and make Jiu Jitsu more available for, the average day warrior, right? So it was was like an important change. It gave me like good know how, and that's the system, the base of the system that I use for for my academy these days. What what have been some things that you've tried to do um, that are different than the way Henzo laid out his school? Is there anything that you've seen that you thought, hey, you know, this is something that maybe is missing in the blue basement that I'd like to expand upon in my own school? Yes. No. One one thing that I noticed. Um, I mean, once you have, it's it's hard sometimes to, you cannot compare, like, you know, and I tell this all the time. Sometimes people people see, you know, they go to the, to the Blue Basement, they go to Hanzo's school, and they see that, man, that, it's, that place is, like, outstanding, right? You, you Like, you see, you know, like, have, like, how many mats we have there? I have, like, one, two, three, four, like, three floors, you know, four mat areas, you know, a boxing ring, a cage. So it's like, in, and that's in the middle of Manhattan. So a school that big, we don't see that in Manhattan, right? So people walk in there, they're like, you know, beautiful locker rooms, you know, any, any given time, you're going to have almost like 200 people in there, you know, because they have like all the mats are taken. So um, it's easy to walk yourself in there and be like, oh, yeah, I want to have this. <laughs> no, I want to be Hansel, you know, so like, you know, Couple of years, you know, when I work, so in a couple of years, I'm going to be like him, you know. But man, people forget that, you know, in the beginning, Hansel was teaching like inside, like how the martial arts schools, putting uh, his mats down and taking them out, breaking them apart, you know, every class. But eventually, like, he built up to that. So, but my point with this is it could be challenging to try to start a business just like that, right? With them all, you know, multiple mats. You know, I understand that, like, if you have two mats, you can have multiple classes going on at the same time. But the overhead to start, like, from there, from the get go, the overhead is going to be a huge, right? So it's harder to, it could be, could be a little bit more challenging to, to turn a profit. So, you know, so these things, you know, got to start, like, sizing down a little bit, you know, implementing the same type of system. I, Thought it, uh, uh, um, it was beneficial to to you know also when you start from the scratch, it takes longer to build up your students, right? Because because when you when you get like a beginner, a person whenever trains, and in the in the in the in the class, you know, even though they have like a we have in the we do, they do um, a class a class for white belt, and then if you get after you get your third stripe or fourth stripe, you can go on to the intermediate class uh, if you partner up a white a, a, a person from the street and over the third three or four stripes white belt they can already help them right and they already have something so they can feed off that 
But when you start a class with fresh five, 10 white belts that never trained before, they don't even know how to position themselves. You know, so it, it takes a little bit. So you got to be able to adapt, you know, to those circumstances. So I think uh, I had to, you know, tone it down a little bit, break it down even more in my beginner classes so I can lay down the, the foundation for, for my students. Hollis, there's something that happens on a lot of academies. It, it, it depends on the affiliation. It depends on the teacher. But there are some schools out there that don't allow people to roll for long periods of time. Some, some schools wait until there's like two or three stripes on the white belt. Some people hold, up, hold off on rolling until, there's, until the students are blue belts. What's your opinion to that? When, when do you think is a good time for a student to begin rolling? And um, what, what's always been the way that you've done it? I think it really depends, right, what your goal is. Okay? And I think you can take case by case. All right? But I, I think uh, in, my, in my academy, I, I wait for the students to become like uh, – to have at least about three uh, about three months of training because I have a program that they'll, you know, they'll, in about three months or so, they're ready for uh, for the next program, okay? And in this program, I don't, I, I don't, they don't roll, okay? Um, my reasoning behind this is, uh, is mainly because I understand that sometimes you're going to have a tough person that they, they're going to endure, you know, they're going to get there. They're, you know, be beaten. They want to. They, they don't care. They actually want that, okay. And and uh, some there are some other cases that if they roll and they get their, you know, their face smashed a little bit, because scratched or roughed up a little bit, they might like, man, this is not for me, and they might quit. Okay. So, um, I usually ask my students like, trust me. Give me, you know. Give me three months, you know, because I want you to lay down the foundation for you because when it's time for you to roll, maybe not, you're not going to know. Maybe the moves that you know, you're not going to be able to execute them, but at least you know what's happening. And I want to avoid the fight or flight mode too soon because the way I see it, uh, that's when you can't develop bad habits, right? And it could be, and it could be hard to break. So, you know, I want to I wanna make sure like by the time they, they uh they they get to rolling the specific training or regular rolling they know what a guard is you know uh what can i do from the bottom what can i do from the top what is what am i supposed to do you know what are my goals from top and bottom what oh i'm in side mount what am i supposed to do from side mount from the bottom what i'm supposed to do from the top you know where i go from side mount you know now i'm on mount i can do this i gotta escape that way you know so i want to give them this broad idea with the with the with the fundamentals and let them go because I remember uh at you know doing teaching the beginners class you know we we we, don't, we did, didn't roll roll but they had we did a specific training so it was always like you know a guard pass in the middle of the class or towards the end the specific training that uh depending on the moves that we worked on so and a lot of times like a person like with one, two, first, uh, one or two classes, they'll get in there and they'll look at the instructor and they're like, okay, if they're on the bottom, <laughs> what do I do now? You know, they, you know, they have no idea what to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> so they're, and they're not, most of the times, like, the answer was like, you know what, squeeze your legs there, don't let them open their legs, you know, try to hold them there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then I started to, to think about that. It's like, man, you know, like this is, you know, we got to, you know, so this, to solve that, you are going to have to sacrifice uh, a instructor to be with that person, right? On the on the on the class, to keep, or you're going to have to sacrifice a student that's going to be able that, that is willing to help. You know, most students are they are willing to help, but but they are also there to get their their training, right? So that's that's sort the my my reason. Uh, behind doing that, and I and I really like the results. You know, um, I think my retention grew a lot because of that. Uh, I have like my retention rate for the first uh, three months like above ninety percent. Wow, that's really high. Yeah, that's really high. That's really high. So people stay, you know. 
And to, and to be honest, man, you know, like I have a lot of, and it's not, and it's not like a a, 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 a silly class, you know. Like it's 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 a fundamentals, and I think like funda high level fundamentals are really important in jiu-jitsu. You know, and in this class, I have a time to to explain, you know, and let the, the students drill it, learn. You know, so I think it's really important. It's like, and if you see like uh, my uh, this this class in my my schools. You want to see purple belts, brown belts, you know, sometimes they take that class and they do it and they do it, you know, as a warm up and then they take the second class after. Or they go back, you know, for people who are coming back from injuries, they like to take the class a lot because they drill and they don't roll. So I think it's uh, it's actually my most popular class. Yeah, it's interesting. Something that happens as people get better and better at jujitsu is um, they, they go through the fundamental classes for, for a long time in the beginning. And then they start kind of building their game. So they start getting into more complex uh, ideas in jujitsu, like open guard variations and passing styles. They start thinking more of, okay, like now how do I apply my jujitsu against someone else that also knows jujitsu? And it's not that they leave the fundamentals behind. It's just that they're focusing more on sharpening up their weapons as they move forward. And what can happen sometimes is you get, you know, purple or brown belts. It even happens. It happens to me too, where I'll jump into a fundamentals class sometimes. And I'm like, oh yeah, like, damn that. I, for, I totally forgot. Like I do that, but I kind of forgot why I do that. You know what I mean? And so going through the classes sometimes is just uh, a really good reminder of why we do the fundamental things that you might not even think about anymore once you get to the advanced level, you know? Yeah. So no, it's, I, I, it's really important. Like, you know, and some people say like, you know, uh, like my cousin Hodges game, oh, Hodges, like it's all fundamentals. It's a yes and no, you know, statement because maybe it's fundamentals because you don't see him like doing the breathing bolos, you know, like they're all the kind of the fancy stuff, but nobody does his fundamentals on the level that he does. It's like fundamentals at the highest level, you know? So like, it's, is it still fundamentals if it's such a high level, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was so, I was I was joking with Hodger when he was on the show last time. I said, "Man, you do the fundamentals at the Jedi level," and say, so, "Yeah, you got it." Yeah, it it really is, and it, it works. It works so well, and it, I feel like the fundamentals are the things. The fundamentals, for sure, are, are the aspects of are the parts of jujitsu that will never fail you. They're, they're the ones that, yeah. that you can always fall back on. And even people who have really experimental and, and flashy games, they often are successful with it because if that doesn't work, they fall right back on their fundamentals. Exactly, so yeah. they're able to they're able to build on that, right? It's like I remember when I was a kid, uh, my brother and I was much better than this at this than me, but we used to love Legos, right? So at first, when we get a Lego sets, we we used to use instructions to build, you know, and after a few days we. We break it down and throw everything in like in our, we have like a, a hamper uh, or a, a drawer, you know, a big drawer that we keep our Legos in and we start building on our own. You know, Igor was a lot more creative than I on that, but, you know, but if we didn't have the fundamentals of building with the instructions, we wouldn't be able to do that, right? So I think it's like a, it's like a good uh, uh, analogy if we can uh, compare it. For people who are coming in the doors as new students, I know that the, that the reason people that come to jujitsu nowadays has changed. It changes over time. I think mm -hmm. that when I first started training, the purpose was more jujitsu was much more tied to MMA. So a lot of you'd see a lot of guys coming in that wanted to learn jujitsu in order to fight in MMA and and go that route. Uh, and then the mm -hmm. other people, the other people you'd see is self defense. People just wanted to learn self defense. Uh, and then occasionally yes. you get people who just are into martial arts and wanted to learn mar to learn a new martial art. These days, though, in your opinion, if you if when you're getting new people walking in through the doors of your academy, what are they generally looking for? Do you think? Man, I think they're mostly looking for self defense, discipline, you know, like a change of lifestyle, a change of, like a change of habits. I think that's mostly what uh, they're looking for. You know, I don't I don't know like my students that uh, uh, that walk in. Because they saw the the worlds, you know, the final of the worlds, and uh, then they decided to go. You know, a lot of times, like you know, Joe Rogan plays a major role on that. You know, he talks a lot about. I think he's uh, he's one of the, our our biggest uh, ambassadors. Absolutely. You know, and uh, and I think like uh, it's probably like he and people. Oh yeah, because everybody listens to him. You know, not and you know, not even not not and not even MMA fans. You know, general people listen to him. So he's always talking about jiu-jitsu, how important jiu-jitsu is to life, and people decide to give it a try, you know? And a lot of referrals, too. You know, the more the sports grow, the people 
bring their friends. Man, this is, you know, I'm doing this awesome thing called Jiu-Jitsu. You know, you should give it a try. I, I like asking that question because we've seen the sport grow so much over the last 10 years. Um, yes. and, it, and it just seems to be accelerating faster and faster at all times. We have all kinds of great events out there. Obviously, ADCC is now doing their their opens, which is which is opening things up a lot. And you're seeing it more and more at the forefront uh, on social media and things like that. So I feel like the, the audience that jiu-jitsu has acquired now is bigger than it's ever been. So I was curious, that just as a school owner, whether or not you've noticed an uptick in, in, from people coming in because of that, because maybe they saw ADCC or they saw Gordon Ryan do something cool on social media or, or anything like that, you know, so. I okay. I, I occasionally yes but i don't even know how to if if i would describe a, a percentage but uh yeah i don't know i think like you know like the uh the the competition the jiu-jitsu competition the grappling competition they are growing a lot yes but i think they are growing because of the practitioners are growing the number of practitioners is growing I don't think I, don't, I still feel that uh, it's a it's a it's a big challenge to bring jujitsu as a sport uh, to uh, to the general audience. What do you think can be done to make that easier? Uh, what's what's because because it seems like we're doing all the right things. Like we're making the, we got these cool events that are really eye catching. We're we're on UFC Fight Pass where there's flow grappling. There's lots of ways to access jujitsu content. What else can be done? Do you think to 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 make it even more accessible to the average person. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, I think, um, I think no gi is definitely, I, I think like, uh, let's, let's try to put things on a scale here on a, on a, as on a comparison uh, uh, level, like uh, no gi versus gi. Is it, what, which one is better for the, the, the person who doesn't have, who never watched Jiu Jitsu? I think no gi, is easier for them to relate to wrestling, which is like very popular because everybody knows what's wrestling in the US. You the you know MMA, the UFC. I think they can compare, they can relate, right? But also, but, but and on the other side, there's like a beauty and like this thing of like of of, of the gi, right? I think like it's very nice to see like the gi. You people like can relate, you know, to like um, all forms of martial arts, right? They can think of, okay. To me, I, I still think like the are the the most challenging issue is the rule set, and I don't know there's like so much we can do about it because how you gonna you know how do we you know we've seen, we've seen many 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 events that with many different rule sets you know some that we try you know I think eventually somebody's gonna figure it out. You know, um, you know, like the last ADCC, I think, uh, how many people are there, were in the arena? There are oh, 10,000 yeah, or something, something like ridiculous. that. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I believe, and I believe all those are practitioners, yes. right? I would imagine you know, so. Or at least yeah. like, I would imagine so. Yeah. I think, I think we're, I think we're so, still at the place where spectators in jujitsu are, are mostly jujitsu practitioners, but to be able to fill yeah. up an arena like that, I mean, that means there's a lot, like you said, the, the amount it's, of, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. nice. No, it's, you know, it, it means like it, it gives hope, right, for people who are who are doing events, right? We are we're doing, we, you know, we we like the the traction that we were getting on uh, with uh, Kasai, right, at the time. Um, but you know, COVID came and put a hold up, put a hold, you know, put a stop on uh, any live event, you know. So. Um, and we need so we in New York we be we're getting you know like a good two three thousand people in the in the audience you know so like really but again mostly practitioners like everybody's like practitioners so um and if it's only practitioners you know you're gonna most of your 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 revenue is gonna come from uh, these jujitsu brands right as sponsorship we, they don't have a lot. Right, uh, you want to have to use like one of those specific streamings, whether it's Fight Pass or anybody else, um, and ticket sales. Yeah, yeah. You know, not, you're not you're not gonna hit like a major, you know, beverage or beer or car company, you know, to to sponsor the yeah the event because they don't have enough eyes out there yet. But we're getting there. 
I'm hopeful. Oh, me too. Me too. I think I think it's only a matter of time. I think the like we said, the more people that are practicing jujitsu, the more spectators we get. And um, yeah, I, I like what you said earlier that you know the nogi side of, of of competition is something that feels more relatable to the average person. So I say someone that watches MMA, they're like, okay, I, I can get this. It's basically what MMA does on the ground without strikes. Like, okay, submissions and things. I get it. You know, I think when you add, when you add the gi for people that don't train, that can get confusing. Do you feel that uh, do you feel that nogi is the future of, of, of jujitsu as far as a spectator presentation goes? In other words, do you think that the, the, could, could, could the gi be presented in a way that would be translatable to the average person? I think they're both very technical and, 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 uh, and very uh, uh, and very complex, right for the for pers- for people who doesn't uh, who doesn't train, right? You see, you can see even like on uh, on uh, sometimes people don't don't agree with like points that were awarded or calls on the matches, you know, like and it's so for us the practices are hard, hard to understand the rules and you know the calls, you know, you know. So I think like honestly I don't know because I think both they both have potential, you know. It's just how we how we educate people. About the rules, you know, we try, we try, we try to simplify things. Uh, like aside, you know, like we did, like advantage was a point, you know, um, you know, some little things, you know, like we changed the uh, the back take rule. Um, I think IBJJF only allows uh, the the regular the regular hooks, right? Not if you have the the feet crossed or the or the figure four. So in Kasai, like our our understanding was, if you have your chest against somebody's back, and whether your feet are crossed, you know, figure four or traditional hooks, as long as you hold for, you know what I mean, show control for X amount of three seconds, it that's a back take to me. We talked earlier about the uh, the various rule sets that exist in jiu-jitsu, and that's, of course, something that will always keep jiu-jitsu out of the Olympics, but I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I, I prefer that we don't get involved in the Olympics, uh, personally speaking. But with that said, what do you feel would be the best rule set if jiu-jitsu had a unified rule set? If there was one rule set that everyone had to follow, like what do you feel is is your favorite? Of course, I'll, I'll be biased towards Kasai, right? Because those are the rules that we tweaked. Um we try to. There was a because in the end it was an experiment trying to use like a few events that we liked, right? Uh, we 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 decided to do like no gi because you know it was gonna be easier for the we for the MMA fan, right? Um, we put not too long of a match matches looking to for people to to for action. Right, so they can push the pace. We were a little bit more rigid when it comes to stalling, right? Um, we awarded points for a set of advantages. I like the side rules. I like to be honest. You know, I liked it. It was like we had we had some good action there. You know, ten minute ten minute matches sometimes for a regular person, like you know, it could be like more, especially that uh, you know. So I don't know. I think I, I like Kasai rules to be honest. The Kasai rules were awesome. What, what was your inspiration with starting Kasai? Like when, when you when you first got involved in with building up Kasai, what motivated you the most? And especially when when designing the rules, what did you see that you wanted to do different? Uh, most most of all, man. I mean, it was it was my partner Rich and I right? We both like talked a lot about uh, about uh, about it uh, it's funny though we started i don't know if we, if we talked this on the last uh on a previous podcast but you know i was we had a friend in common eric owens uh i was talking to eric about how i had these ideas for an event and eric told me like man you should talk to rich because rich was talking about how he wanted to do an event um so we we got together and talked about it but i think the idea behind it uh Rich was a big fan of uh, Copa Podio. You know, so that's where we got the format from. And But we both agreed that um, groups of four people, no, five people, I think Copa Podio had, right? Yeah. It was like too long because I've been to a, a, a one or two Copa Podios live and the event takes forever. You know, it's a nice event. It's a, like, four, you know, I like the round robin format, but I think like, 
five guys, you know, per bracket was maybe a little bit too much. So we decided to cut it down to four. Um, you know, we also agreed that uh, ten minute matches could be a little bit too much for the for the general audience. And uh, and points from the get go, you know, like you know, like uh, we wanted to try to see as many points as possible. You know, so that's why, like you know, we talk, and we saw everything. You know, ADCC, you know, it was good to good experience to learn. And one of the reasons that we decided to do um, six minutes was because most of the matches, you know, now like you have like different type of fights, but most of the matches in ADCC. It was funny because they had the first five minutes, no points, and then have points after that. And it's almost like when the ref says, okay, points, the athletes is lap hands and bump fists. So it's almost like, okay, now we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like they have a little bit of agreement. Let's just like move around. If a good opportunity comes about, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, 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 take it, but otherwise I'm just going to, you know, Ease my way into it. But then you start seeing, like, you know, guys like Gordon, for instance. And now he, like, he was action from the get go. He was, like, started to set up his, his leg attacks, his attacks from, you know, from minute one, not just waiting. So I think that uh, helps too. But so because of that, because we realize that people are, like, just waiting and waiting and waiting to start fighting and say, you know what? Let's just do, like, six minutes. Let's get action from the, from the, from when the, when the bell rings, you know, right away. So on the starting point. So that was a, a, a reasoning for it. One of the reasons that I like the idea that there's so many different rule sets that exist in jiu-jitsu is it allows the competitors to find the places that they like the best. Like there might be people that um, that like the ADCC, the ADCC format and they prefer that format. If there's people that might like IBGF, GI, jiu-jitsu. That's, yeah. that's kind of their specialty. I like that people can have specialties and and cross over into different things and try, you know, test their skills and, and, and rule sets that they're normally not accustomed to. Um, so it, it's something that the, I think is, is really neat. What, uh, kind of on that theme, for students that want to start competing, obviously there's more opportunity now than ever. I mean, there's, you know, events every oh. every month, everywhere you, pretty much everywhere you live. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. So, so as an instructor, what do you think the greatest benefits are of competing? For students, for students that might be listening that are kind of on the fence, they're not sure if they want to compete or not. What words of encouragement would you tell them, for, you know, to to to, empl- to to emphasize the the good that they would get out of trying to compete? This is a good question because I definitely think jujitsu is not for every. Uh, no, sorry, jujitsu is for everyone. Competing is not for everyone, right? I feel that this somebody has a desire to do it, and I think they should do it. I think it should uh, it should uh, or they have the the question in their head, should I compete, should I not? Maybe, you know, maybe approach the, the instructor or their professor and talk about the goals, you know, so maybe the professor is going to find a, 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 the route, the, the, the proper route for you to 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 compete. You know, I, get, I have some students that sometimes they're like fresh, six months in, and then they come in, oh, I signed up for this tournament, I signed up for that tournament. You know, like I even had like a guy who signed up for MMA fight without telling me. <laughs> oh, I'm competing, I'm competing. You know, like, what's amateur? You know, but like, I'm competing, competing this weekend. I said, oh, which tournament? Because always oh, this amateur MMA. I said, dude, why didn't you tell me? You know, <laughs> I could have, I would have, you know, at least I could have helped yeah. you, you know, along the way. Yeah, I'm going to be there in your corner, but I could have helped you, like, be more specific with the training, you know. But I think definitely like, competing, definitely like your. It's a testing ground, right? I compete a lot, but I don't necessarily push my students to compete. Like I don't make them like, oh, if they want to compete. Don't get me wrong; I, I will motivate them to compete. I will, I motivate, I will give them the tools that they need to compete. But because it's such, I feel that it's such a personal, such a personal choice that I don't want my students to feel that uh, they're the ones who don't want to compete to feel that I'm going to like them less because of that, or if they're going to be held on the, on the uh, 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 back, on their belts, on, you know, and things because they don't want to compete. You know, so I usually, I usually, I usually tell the, my students, like, man, um, I have my medals in my school, like in the, in the, in my, in the New Jersey school. I, I lost a bunch of my medals, but I have a bunch there 
hanging and I tell them like, man, all these in the, that you see in the hanging on the walls, this is just hardware. And I'll throw everything all out if uh, 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 if I wouldn't get the benefits of, you know, of Jiu-Jitsu. Like, to me, like the benefits of competing is, is the tip of the iceberg, right? You get everything below that, right? I think it's like, to me, it's like, uh, yeah, it's almost like the, the culmination, right? It's not the foundation, if it makes sense. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, let me ask you this. What, what? How are the metrics that you use to judge whether a student moves up in rank different between a really competitive student and someone that does not want to compete at all? What kind of things do you look for that might be different in those two different students? Yes, this is, man, you know, jiu-jitsu is such like, it, it, it's not an easy sport to watch, to judge, and to award a... Uh, 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 ranks right because especially these days if we want to bring jiu-jitsu available to everyone we we gotta have different measurements right to do that i cannot compare a guy who started in his 50s right the trains two three times a week after work with a 20, 18, 19, 20, 20 something year old kid who's there every day and wants to compete, right? How do I hold them, you know, to the same uh, 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 standards? One is going to be able to, the standards of the kids is a lot higher than the other guy, right? So that's, uh, so, the, you know, I it, of course, like uh, when as they're getting, High on the ranks, it's it's a little bit more on a case by case thing. But like some people, you see that uh, they reach, they're not gonna advance more than that. You know, that's what they are. You know, if, but if they get good at that, you know, the particular things that they do, you know, they should, you know, evolve at the rank. You know, but also we need to understand these practitioners. They need to understand it. That they shouldn't compare themselves with the with the with the young kid. What well, professional it is, right? I'm a, I am a, um, a skydiver, as a hobby, right? I have a hobby of skydiving. Man, when I go to the drop zone and I see all the aces flying, man, I wish I would I, I, I would fly like that. But I know I'm just I'm a hobbyist, you know. Like I I do like you know like I don't know. How many jumps are you now? I'm like, man, since I move, I one of the reasons I moved to Florida is so I could jump more, <laughs> and I'd be jumping less. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you for the for the fifty year old guy that trains three days a week, what are you looking for to, to to judge whether or not he's ready to move up in rank? Say he starts as a white belt, what are you looking for for blue belt, purple belt, brown to black? Man, basically what I see, what I see is this: if that guy who comes, this guy who's coming three times a week. Right, this fifth, this average person who's coming three times a week to the academy. If by the end of the, you know, about in a give or take a year or so, a year, a little bit more, if he's not on the blue belt level, I failed him as an instructor. You know, so like I have my system, you know, to bring these people again. If but if they're competing, I want to say, bro. You're gonna have to train every day, you know, and which in about a year they might get the, the, they'll probably be they'll probably graduate together, but they're in a different levels. It's like in school, right? Some kids, some some students are a a level, others are B or C. Everybody graduates, you know, like into like you know into into a, into a certain range, right? But if that guy, that same 50, they say, oh, you could be a young person. If the same, if, if a 20-year-old only goes two, three times a week, you know, he doesn't do the, it's always like doesn't doesn't skip the warm-up, you know, get late, you know, doesn't do as much drilling, you know. He's not going to, the other guy's going to evolve a lot better than him, a lot faster, right? So it's like it's uh, uh, Marcy Rooney, my strength and conditioning coach for and mentor for and he told he used to tell us uh, 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 he used to tell this all, all the time like you get what you put in 
Yeah, but I'm definitely, man, I'm definitely, like, if, if they know, if they know, if they know how to execute my basic curriculum, I don't have belt testing, but uh, if they, if they, I can see if they perform me, you know, they can't execute, you know, the basic curriculum, I think they, they should be ready for the, for the blue belt. That's excellent. Well, no, know? I think, I think it's great that you laid this out, because I think a lot of people that start jujitsu, they may not understand what exactly their instructor is looking for. And I think that, I think a lot of instructors out there that have students uh, of all walks of life probably see it the same way you do, or at least very similarly, where it's like, look, there's a, there's a guy with three kids. He's here three days a week. And then there's a college kid who's here like, you know, all the time when he's not studying. And so obviously you can't put them on the same, on the same ranking trajectory. It's going to be a different kind of thing. So I think it's, it's important for people to hear experienced instructors like you say things like that. Yeah. But this is one of the, one of the bad things that we do, you know, us as jiu-jitsu practitioners and instructors and, you know, came, which is like a, 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 it's a bad thing. They're like, you know, when people ask, oh, what do I need to do to get my belt? You know, usually people tap them on the back. Man, don't worry. Just keep showing up, keep training, and eventually you're going to get your belt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's like, and the guy was like, okay. I guess, you know, but maybe he'll make it, maybe probably and almost likely he won't. So I think this is like one of one of the one of the struggles that I that I know that exist in the jiu-jitsu and I try to you know, and for a long time I've been thinking about like, man, should I test people, should I not test, you know? I know it's very frowned upon, but I see the benefits also. So it's like I, you know, because I always try to, you know, provide the best service for, and you know, the best jiu for my, and experience for my students, you know. So I always, like, when every change I do, I try to, I have them, them in mind, not me. Yeah. What makes you not want to do testing? Um, One, like, testing, you know, I think, like, in the jiu world, it, it's changing a little bit, but it was, like, very, at least one of, from when I came about, when I was coming up, it was very frowned upon. Like man, you test, you 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 do the moves uh, without resistance. You pay, and then you get the belt. You know, people basically people was like, yeah, you buy your belt, right? So that was like a a, a problem, you know. So I don't know if I'm a, I'm a, I'm a in favor of charging. That's a dilemma that I, I'm not. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Okay, this is just like my how I the dilemmas that I have. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I should charge or not my students to, if I would were to test them, right? Um, two, the second problem I see with uh, 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 with testing, it could be like, what exactly am I looking for on the testing? Is what I want because. Some students are going to be good, you know, uh, uh, at, at a certain styles. You know, some are going to be bad at certain passes. Others are going to be bad at certain sweeps, you know. So, like, do I make them do what I think is right, you know, like, or should I be a little bit more flexible, you know? Should I test maybe, like, oh, you got to show me X amount of sweeps, X amount of guard passes, X amount of submissions or whatever, and just... Or should I have like my okay? You gotta be able to do this, you know, because I understand there's a flexibility in jujitsu, right? There's like body type, you know, attributions and all that. Um, and then three, it's like to me, it's like if I'm gonna test somebody, I wanna fail them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do like you really want to like you know? Okay, today's gonna be belt testing day. The person goes there, brings the whole family, you know, and they, sorry, better luck next time. Bad for attention. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. so I rather like let them go, like evolve on their own pace, you know, and not like schedule specific. But now this is like the challenging part, right? But the good part, I think it's definitely like, okay, you're going to make your students think about it, what they're doing, why they're doing you know they're gonna uh, uh, they're gonna learn how to you know execute the moves properly and understand get some feedback you know why they passed why they did not pass you know and all those things so like you could even throw in some you know history 
in there because, you know, history is important. You know, who are the pioneers? Who started, you know, like this and that? So I think it's like, so I definitely see some benefits of uh, of, of testing. But again, this is something that's like, it's been in my mind for the last few years. Do you mind if I provide, can I, can I give you my perspective from a student's perspective? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, of so, course. So, so here's here's my thoughts on it. So, so I tested for my brown belt and it was actually the only belt that I actually had to physically test for. Um, I, I changed schools along the way a couple times from from white to, to white to brown belt. But um, when I got to my brown belt, I, I I got my brown belt under Paul Creighton, who's one of Henzo's early black mm-hmm. belts back in the day. Um, yes. So when Paul did it, I liked I really liked the way he did it. He number one, he didn't charge he doesn't charge for the test, which I which, as a student, if I was paying a monthly tuition and then I had to pay for the test. Personally, that would irk me a little bit. I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't be yes. a fan so much of that. I would think, hey, look, I'm, I'm already paying a pretty good mm-hmm. amount of money here every month to pay to test now, it would feel like I'm buying a belt and it would also feel, you know, for some people it could be stressful just financially. Um, so he didn't charge me for the, for the test. And then also he, the test is in private. So it's just you and one of the black belts and it could be, it could be directly with him or it could be with one of the other teachers in the school. And he had a, um, a book basically that, that he would, that he would loan us. And I think they send out in like PDF form now where it's just a list of like, okay, if you're testing for brown belt or whatever belt you're testing for, here's the things we expect to see. We want to see X amount of sweeps, X amount of takedowns, X amount of, X amount of self-defense techniques, uh, you know, whatever. This is a list for every category. And he wants to see, you pick your own techniques, but let me see, you know, what you have and what you do uh, and you try to fill up an option for each category. Then there are some categories where there are specific things. Like he says, I want to see you do a double leg takedown from standing. I want to see you do, you know, a case of Katami. I want to see you do, you know, there, there are some specific things he wants to actually see. And, uh, and then you do the, you, you have time to, pre- they let you know ahead of time, like, Hey, you have one month to, to do, to do your test, uh, show up when you're ready. And, um, and then when I did it, I, I kind of knew what was expected of me. Um, I presented the best that I could and I ended up getting my Brown belt. And I felt good about it because one, uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on me because it was just me and the instructor. And if, had I failed, he would have been able to say, Hey, here's, here's where you missed it. Come back in 30 days. Try again. You know, I didn't lose any money. I wasn't embarrassed in front of my family or friends or in front of the class. Yeah. yeah. So maybe that's a way. I mean, if you, if, if it's something you're mulling over as from my perspective, that's, I, I really liked the way my instructor, Paul Creighton did it. Was, he, he did nice. It. That's yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah. But, and I, I think I could see where, um, if I had to pay for it too, I would, there would all, and I, and I passed, there would always be that thing in the back of my head. Like, well, did I really buy this belt or did I actually pass? Like, was that, did I do everything perfect? Exactly, or did they just not exactly. want to, you know, not award it to me after I've paid. So I think that, I think it's, it's good exactly. to think of that. Yeah. I, I'm not be funny. If you, if you ask me this, like, I don't know, six, seven, five years ago, maybe I was like, that belt, that's it. I never got tested for my belts. No, we're talking about that bad testing. Test is every day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was me, but now no, you know. I, yeah, I, I, I see, I see a lot of benefits for sure, for sure. Because uh, especially when you're getting like a, uh, 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 you know, purple brown, getting closer to your black belt. I think like you should, when you're testing, when you're showing the moves, you're actually teaching the move to the instructor that is watching. Right, and and I think there's like a huge benefit of a, of a being an instructor. You see jujitsu from a different side, because one thing is execute. I just want to execute. I want to drill. I want to drill. I'm going to drill. But if when you might have to actually show it to somebody, it's it changes. It absolutely you know? does. Yeah. I did, I did an instructor's course at my academy, and this was uh, interesting because. I had a, you know, I had a good amount of, amount of students and uh, I gave him like, okay, this, the, the course is going to be on this day. You know, I have a, a video library of my, uh, of my core curriculum, which is my basic, my, my fundamentals program. Um, watch the videos, you know, that's your homework for the, for the thing. Watch the videos, study a little bit. And then uh, I... I started the, the the course the the class with them. I talked a little bit. I talked a little bit, like briefly, you know, the etiquette about the instructor, you know, what to do, what you know, what we're looking for, what is acceptable, what is not, what is like this like big uh, 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 nose, um, and what should you do, how you should behave, how you should act. Um, 
And then I went, okay. So now, you and you, come over here. Teach me a move. They're like, uh, uh, uh. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> make a move. Make a move. Make a move from, from the from the from the from the curriculum and, and teach me. I don't care. Just teach me. Just teach some. You're like, I mean, no, I, I said no, teach the class. Teach teach them uh, teach the move. And you're know, teaching some teaching look at me. Oh yeah, I said, no, no, don't look at me, look at your students there. <laughs> and what was unanimous at the end, everybody was like, man, teach is so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> You know, um, but it's, I think it's like, you know, like the, when you, when we talked about competing before, you know, yeah, competing definitely puts you, uh, brings you to a, a high level, but teaching also oh, yeah. teaching when you start, like if you have a channel, you know, sometimes I, 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 I try to get my students to help in class, assist in class, commit to assist in class, uh, because I know it's important for them to, to have a, a different view from jiu-jitsu. It's really important. It's really important. You develop a lot because you have to solve other people's problems, not your own. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I've heard a lot of teachers and a lot of instructors over the years say that the more they teach, the better they understand jiu-jitsu and the better they get. Because it's kind of like what I was saying earlier, like when the advanced student goes back and takes a fundamental class again, you're reminded of all these details that you sort of just go on autopilot on normally because it's something you've already yep. learned and developed over time. Uh, but it really helps to go over the details. And when you have to, like you said, explain it to someone else and break it down into all the pieces, sometimes there's pieces that you're like, oh yeah, that is like a really important piece. And it makes you emphasize that more when you apply it later as you're training with other higher belts. And um, I also yeah. like the idea that, you know, there's three different phases that happen to people in jujitsu. There's, there's the, there's learning to do jujitsu, learning to be a student. And then there's uh, learning to be a competitor because I think competing in jujitsu, when you compete and when you roll in class, it really is two very different things. Um, you know, obviously mm -hmm. competition has a lot of adrenaline involved. It's it's someone that you don't know. It's someone who's coming at you 100%. Uh, it, 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 you have to learn how to be a competitor, I think. Uh, it, it's not just like rolling. And then over time, you learn to be an instructor. I think those are the three, the three phases of learning that you can do from a student's yes. perspective. It's really cool to hear someone like you that's done all three very well uh, elaborate on that. So I, I appreciate that insight. Well, it's nice because jiu-jitsu is like, it's like a, a continuous uh, um, uh, assessment of where you are, right? I'm training, I'm rolling. I got to keep assessing. It's like, man, it's almost like every second I got to keep reassessing uh, uh, where I am, what I want to do, what I have, what's in front of me, right? Uh, and when you and when you're instructing, you get to do this on a slower pace. You have the time, so you learn how to assess the scenario, figure out the difficulties that the student is having, and then you can apply. You can turn, switch, flip the switch on your brain of always reassessing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it'll, it'll, there's always a goal to achieve in, in whichever facet of, of the art that you're in right now. So like for, for students, the goal to achieve is obviously improving and becoming better in the classroom and have, doing, having more yeah. success when you're rolling. For competitors, winning more tournaments, winning more matches. And then for teachers, developing the sharpest students that you can. Like it become, there's always like a, a cool objective and a, yep. a, a, an objective to the game, sort of, which, whichever facet you're in, which I think is really that's cool. I mean, like whatever, whatever yeah. route you take through jujitsu, there's always a, a really cool objective to go after. So, yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's, that's the, that's the beauty of a sport, right? And when you, and when you, or, or art, right? And when you said that, uh, oh yeah, I'm, I don't know if I'm in favor of jujitsu going to the Olympics. You know, I, and I feel you too, because which uh, uh, of those like uh, uh, Olympic, uh, fighting styles that people do for, for as a hobby wrestlers when they when they're done wrestling that's it you know they, if they don't become coaches that's it they want to do something else you know Jude, judoka same thing you like who likes you know which average person who likes to get like being taken thrown boom 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 for hobby for fun yeah, that definitely you, can do, you can do that you know what i mean plus we're not going to be controlled by uh these uh these major bodies 
that's my big, that's my big, that's one of my big things with, with why I don't want it to go to the Olympics. Cause I, I know a lot of, I have a lot of judoka friends that all say the same thing. They're like, man, I think, I think that being involved in the Olympics was, was kind of a, a mistake. You know, I think there, there's not a mistake, but like there, there was a lot of negatives that came with being, you know, part of the Olympic games and having one big overseeing body <clears throat> judging everything, you know, dictating everything. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I like I like I like the our arts a little more free. There's a little different flavors for people that want to try different yes. things, and that's that's pretty cool. Um, hold this, I'll tell you what, man. We've reached a portion of the show. I don't remember if we did this last time you were on the show. I can't remember. I think I started doing the pummel around like 2007. Well, yeah, I think it was on like 2016 or 2017. So maybe you did do this. Anyway, it's a game halfway through. We play on every show. It's called the pummel. Uh, the pummel is a series of <laughs> random questions. Some of these are about jujitsu. Some of these questions have nothing to do with jujitsu. But if you're down to play the pummel, I'd love to play this game. Let's do it. Let's go, man. Question one. What's the worst job you ever had? Worst job I ever had? Man, it had to be, I was, uh, when I moved to, to Boca Raton, like uh, in, back in two, 1997, I think, I was uh, uh, a helper in a, in a kitchen restaurant. It wasn't the, the, the most, it wasn't very fun. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> were, you, were you were you were you like running stuff back? Were you like an expediter, like the guy that like like delivers the uh, the food to the, to the serve from, from the kitchen between the kitchen and the server, or were you doing uh, like cleanup? And I was doing. I was the guy like you know I had to pull like you know the, put stuff in the fridge, you know like the, those like big freezers, oh, remove yeah. stuff from there, you know like uh, chop uh, you know fifty onions, oh, you know uh, peel a hundred eggs, you know. Uh, all these, all these things, and the funny man, and uh, and it, 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 it's a funny story because I was man, you know, whatever job I do, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do, it, be the best I can be. Yeah. And this, I was, I was, I think it was twenty, uh, ninety eight. Yeah, I was like twenty years old, uh, ninety like nineteen twenty years old, and I, um, it's funny because I gave a. Uh, I went. I moved to to Boca, you know, and I was in my living with my mother, and she by by the end after the holidays, she gave me a hundred dollar bill and I post it, and she goes, "Listen, this is the last money I'm giving you. Take this post it, call this number. They have a job for it." <laughs> nice, S sink or swim. So I was like, sink or swim. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can live here. You can live here. There, there's food, you know. But if you want to pay for your car. You're gonna pay. You're gonna pay for the insurance, gas on your car, and the and the stormers in your car. That's that's on you. But I think I worked. I I worked there for two three weeks, and then I was able to 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 find to get like a you know a private student. The one with one private class, I was making more the entire week. Oh, that's amazing. So that's amazing. I was like, Phew. yeah, thank God. Huh? Yeah. yeah, that that doesn't sound like too much fun, man. That sounds like a stressful. A yeah. a no, but I was running. But I was running doing everything as fast as I can. <laughs> And then the lady that worked like she was like the head there of the kitchen, she looked at me like, "Hey, relax, <laughs> slow down. The more you do it, the more they're gonna ask exactly. you to do it." So, yeah. don't, don't, yeah. I said, "Hey, I don't know. You know what I mean, I just..." It's one of those jobs <laughs> like you don't want them to know how how efficient and how good you are. Because they're like, "Oh yeah, okay. Here's some here's a pile more, another uh, pile of yeah. onions for you to chop." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think is a secret talent that you have? A secret talent that I have, man. Wow, I don't know. Secret talent that I have. Can you dance? Can you sing? Man, I wish. I cannot dance. I cannot sing. I wish I know how to play an instrument. I try learn the learning the bass, but it's really hard, man. Uh, secret talent. Ah, I guess I can. I guess I'm a greasy that can fly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. You got your 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 bait. Your bait. Your uh, skydiving. That's all. How, how many jumps? How many jumps yes. have you done now? Over a thousand. Oh my god, man, that's crazy. That's amazing. What, what's <laughs> that's it not feel, a lot. Huh? What's it feel like when you when like the first time when you jump out of the plane? What what is it? What do you just, just describe what you feel? <laughs> it's funny because it's not interesting. So I'm gonna try to tell it quick. Uh, my brothers Igor and Grano they went to um, compete in uh, in Abu Dhabi, and then they went to Dubai to jump and skydive Dubai in the you know by the palm, uh, and they came back hooked. So they signed up to become skydivers, you know, do the course. And I, they told me about it. I was like, man, I want to do it too. But I had a, I had a fight schedule. I was training. I was in like in training camp. So I could. So I didn't do it. 
and this they they they, they got a head start on me, right? And when they, then after the fight, I said, okay, now I'm gonna I wanna sign up to learn to get my license. And they said, listen, they're gonna ask you if you if you had a tandem jump before. Just say you did, you know, because like they're gonna make you do like another ch- tandem jump anyway. They make you do three. You just get one out of the way, and uh, and I said, okay, you save some money and you save some time. I said, okay, so I went there. I said, yeah, I had a tandem jump. Yeah, yeah. Okay, back in Brazil. Yeah, okay, okay. So I went to ground school. Basically, I spent the whole day, like eight hours, uh, with the instructor telling me uh, how I was gonna die and what I was supposed to do to save myself. <laughs> so okay. So after this these eight hours, uh, you know, I go on. I get a ten. Now I get a short You know, like uh, I get hooked in an instructor and go on a plane to jump. But in this jump, even though he's on me uh, behind me, you know, he's gonna have control of the shoot and everything. But I still have to look at the altimeter, you know, perform a turn, you know, do things like that. Otherwise, I'll have to, I'll fail and I have to do it again. So when I was up. Man, I, I was thinking, man, I should have listened to me going great. I should have done my, <laughs> my first tandem, you know, relax, you know, know what's it about. And I'm going up on the plane, and I'm like, man, I was so nervous. And I'm, I'm talking to myself, bro, relax, man. You're a fighter. You know, competing a lot in jiu-jitsu. And I'm like, no, but it's not the same. <laughs> it's you know, really like, not yeah, the same. Yeah, you're in the cage. And I'm like, man, it's not the same. <laughs> it's two very different things, And man. I'm like, yeah. but I was the last one. I was like, okay, so they shut. I said, okay, the door is open. We're gonna go now. You know, they're gonna go, and that then it's us. And to me, it was like, okay, it's like twenty people in front of me. Like it's gonna be a while. The impression that I had was like, in one second, everybody was out, and the guy goes, like, okay, let's go. I said to me, I was like, man, they're calling me to fight. I'm not gonna. Uh, what I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna step in the cage. I gotta go. <laughs> so I flew out of the plane with a guy, you know. And in the end, I was like. Well, it was very stressful. Oh, my God. But, it, but it went well, obviously. You're still with us. That's amazing. It went well, yeah. What, 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 still, yeah. what do you feel like? Do you feel like you're falling or do you feel like you're floating? Like, what, what, is it, what does it feel like? No, you feel like uh, at first, when, when, you, when you start getting off the plane, they call the heel. That's when you accelerate. And then, and then you stabilize. And it's, uh, and it's, like, it's almost like you have like a big uh, fan in front of you. Wow. So, so, you know? so it feels like you're being held. Like, you're being yeah. held up by a big fan. Yeah, you'd be, you'd, you'd, at one point you're being held by the. Air. Wow, wow, that's incredible. And then how long? It's how nice. long do you actually have to drift down before you need to pull your chute? Uh, depending on the type of jump that you do, uh, but you can go like from forty seconds to about a minute. Probably feels. It, it depending probably, the, 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 depend the orientation that you are, right? Uh, yeah, because yeah, the, if you're if you obviously if you're diving, you're going to be going a lot faster than if you're spray, yeah, sprawled out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Does, does the yep. one minute feel longer than a minute? Does it feel like you're up there for much longer than one minute, or does it go by pretty quickly? It goes by pretty quick. I wish it was longer. I wish I was there for like 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like a lot of preparation and a lot of stuff for just like a, a brief a, a rush of adrenaline. No, but, but it's, it's awesome. got to be incredible. It feels, it, feels, yeah. it feels really good, man. It's like it's like you were – because I mean, people think, oh, you're just falling. No, you're not falling because like right now, a lot of the style that I do is called uh, – uh, uh, angle jumps or tracking like you're flying on formation and you're moving with people you know what i mean so like you have like five six people flying together trying to be trying to fly tight and then they make turns together almost like you see like the planes like the blue angels you know flying together so that's like the goal you know that's really incredible. and it's really that's nice incredible, man. have you have you ever have you ever yeah, done any gets... other stuff like those squirrel suit you ever seen those you know, those squirrel suit things that people that no, no, I yeah. haven't. I haven't. Man, there's there's some GoPro videos on YouTube of people skydiving and using the, the squirrel suits. Man, it is. Oh, those. Oh, it's, those are like if you, if you go from a plane, yeah. you can get three to five minutes oh, in. That's crazy, man. That is so crazy. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a wrestler I interviewed. I I I ran the uh the, the fanatic wrestling podcast for a little while, and uh, there was a wrestler I interviewed named Johnny DeJulius, who's a really really solid college wrestler. And he's uh, uh, all in on on skydiving and the squirrel suit thing and free fall, free free, free nice. base jumping and all that stuff. Um, I don't even know that he's actively involved in wrestling anymore. I think he just exclusively does all that stuff. But man, there was a video he posted on YouTube where he was, I think, in a squirrel suit and miscalculated something and landed in a rock and was able to just barely catch himself. And the whole thing's from the perspective of a GoPro video. I'll send it to you. When, I'll send it to you wow. when we're done. But it, man, I nice. see stuff like that and I'm like, okay. It's. I'll watch other people do it. I'll watch other people do the squirrel suit yeah, thing. No, jump, jumping like jumping from like a base base jump with a suit. That's 
That's yeah, dangerous. I can imagine. I can imagine. I can. I, I think. I think probably yeah. if you're jumping out of a plane with plenty of open space and an instructor, it's much more. Oh yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah. But uh, it's something I, yeah. I, I, I'd probably, you know, I, I'd like to check that off my my list. I think if there's, I think everyone has their bucket list of things you yeah. want to do in this life, and I think jumping out of a plane is a pretty awesome one to have for yeah. sure. Uh, man, if you've done a thousand yeah. of them, that's 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 really something. Jeez, man. But I'm, but, but you know what? If I if I if I was to pull like a jujitsu rank on that, I'm probably just like a a, a, a tenacious blue belt. Really? Like a thousand <laughs> is not con- like what's yeah. considered like. A high well, like what would a brown belt be? If you if if you're a tenacious blue belt, what's a brown belt in a jump? How many jumps? I mean, I'll say at least five thousand. Wow. You know, but also the, the the frequency matters a lot, right? I don't go as often. It's like you know, it's 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 like now we're going back to the same thing. Like the kid, the the competitor who trains every day, and the average person who goes there like you know sure, two three sure. times a week. Yeah. You know, so that's the kind of same comparison. That- you know, like people like these guys, you live, you know, they every day in the drop zone. And, and do, do people do like, yeah. like, for example, do they jump out of the plane and then when they get to the ground, suit back up and go up again? Or is it usually, oh, yeah, so they, okay, oh, so, yeah. so they can do it over and over. Yeah, that's what you okay. do. That's you do. Like the most I did one oh, day was like, oh, wow, okay. Okay. Jump so, one day. So this one's like, jump back, go, jump back, go, jump back. Every 20 minutes, you go up again. Wow, that's incredible. So, so you get, yeah, okay, that, that makes more sense now. Because I was thinking of it more of a thing that you have to, like, schedule the time for the plane to be ready with you. And, okay, no, so you no. get to go over and over again. That's cool. That's cool. I can see yeah, now yeah. how you. It's, kind of, it's, it's like an amusement park going on roller coaster over and over and over again. Is it is it pretty expensive <laughs> for, for, for for most places? Uh, it's about, right now the cost of it is about $29, $30 a oh, jump. Oh, wow. If you have your own if you have your own equipment. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a way cheaper than I thought it was going to be. But a tandem jump is a different story, right? Tandem jumps are like more like a, a couple oh, okay. hundred. Okay. 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 Well, even even a couple even a couple yeah. hundred I thought would I thought it'd be more it cost more than that. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it might be more now. It might be like, you know, 250 just with, you know, with a, with a, if you need video it might be a little bit more, you know. That's really cool. Well, man, that's that's definitely a, a super cool talent to have. Being able to being able to uh, by yourself jump out of a plane and make it to the ground. That's 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 awesome. Yeah. Man. That's a really cool talent to have. W- what's something you wish you were better at? Something outside of jujitsu and skydiving that you wish you could do better? I wish I was a better. I wish I was. A... I wish I learned how to play an instrument. You said you tried to play bass, right? Yeah, yes. is, is bass what you think you'd try to pick up on again, or would you try something new? I love the bass. I love the bass. Um, man, I have, but I realized I have zero musical <laughs> years, man. Like, it's, I have no rhythm. I, it's like, man, it's, I don't know. I don't know if I'm trainable. That's surprising point. you got no rhythm, man. You're Brazilian, man. You're the, your Brazilian blood is failing you. What's going on here? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Brazilian who cannot dance. I'm a Brazilian who cannot play soccer. You know? Hey man, you were, meant to be, you, you were meant to be an American it. citizen. It's all good. It's all good. Yes, yes, exactly. That's awesome, man. What do you think is um, your favorite bad food to eat? Favorite junk food? Uh, burgers. Burgers. Okay, good. Describe your perfect burger. My perfect burger. Uh... My perfect burger wouldn't be so junk. <laughs> if you had like part, a leaner, yeah. You know, it would be like a thicker one, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Thicker, like from a sirloin meat, you know, avocado, lettuce, tomato, you know, maybe like a, a pepper jack cheese, you know, like a, like a, like a, a um, how do you call that, uh, that type of bread, the one that's very soft, I forgot the name of uh, like a brioche, a brioche. brioche bo- yeah, brioche, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, that'll be like, you know. But my favorite junk is definitely like it's probably like Shake Shack. Shake that's Shack, my- yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a dangerous one. If you start with that, yeah. it's yeah. yeah. If, you, if you if you if you allow yourself to have Shake Shack, you're going downhill quick. That's for sure. That's a yeah. that's a good. It's good, but it's bad, right? Yeah. Um, what's your most hated food? What's something you cannot eat no matter what? Uh, cannot eat no matter what. 
That's so cool. I mean, I don't. I, I'm not a huge fan of like uh, bell peppers. Pickles. I don't like pickles. Some people love pickles. I don't like pickles. Yeah. You don't. But no. So no. No pickles on the burger then. No. No. Okay. Cool. Please don't All pickle right. my burger. <laughs> don't do that to me. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, bell peppers. Bell peppers are, are, are one of those things where people either love them or hate them. I never, I never really. You don't really see people that are just like, yeah, I don't mind bell peppers. Yeah, whatever. I can take them or leave them. It's usually like keep There's, that away from me. There is or, one that I that I'm okay with it, but I don't know which one is it, so I don't even try anymore. I say, okay, no bell peppers. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> what, what do you, What do you think is your favorite takedown? What well, should be takedown? Ah, uh, double leg. Double leg. Good classic. Uh, who's your, Who's your favorite grappler of all time? If I don't uh, count my father, um, I'm going to say Hodger. Hodger, good choices. Your father and Hodger are both excellent choices. What about a uh, favorite MMA fighter of all time? Okay, I'm going to pick some people outside of my family, okay? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discard that. Uh, GSP. GSP, good choice, good choice. Yeah. Uh, what was, what is your biggest phobia? Biggest phobia. Biggest phobia is probably, uh, biggest phobia. There's a, a cockroaches count. Yeah, absolutely. It does. Yeah. Cockroaches are nasty. But, yeah. Yeah. Now you, you, you've experienced, like. you've, you've gotten this, you've gotten to see two different styles of cockroaches because you've lived in New, New York and New Jersey, which are like more like yeah. German roaches. And then you've also lived in Cal in uh, Florida now where they've got this yeah. huge, the, what they call them palmetto bugs, but let's palmetto, be, yeah, they're, yeah. they're big roaches. Yeah. Which one freaks yeah. you out more? Yeah. Do, do the palmetto the bugs? The brown one, the little, the, 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 the one that comes from the sewage. They come, oh yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause the one day, these ones that are yeah. like, you know, out here like the woods, like these ones are like, we have those ones in Brazil, like huge ones. And they fly over their nest. Yeah. Their nest. Yeah, those are nasty ones for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is? Um, uh, oh, I always ask the Brazilians this one. Who's your? Do you have a soccer team in Brazil? Flamengo. Flamengo. You're from Rio, of course, man. Of course, it has to be yeah, Flamengo. Yeah. It has to be. Has to be Flamengo. Um, what about your favorite submission? What's your favorite submission? Head and arm. Head and arm. Good choice. Good choice. Uh, what do you think is your favorite kind of music to listen to? Right now, uh, Christian music. Christian music, nice, nice. Do you like uh, Do you like more like gospel or do you like Christian rock or what? What do you listen to? I like uh, I like all kinds. You know, I like uh, elevation worship. I like uh, 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 Maverick City. Nice, nice. You know, um, I like this. Now let's see, a few weekend, Brandon Lake. It's more like they're various. Awesome, man. Awesome. Uh, what, yep. what do you think is the, um, if jujitsu didn't exist, what do you think you'd be doing with your life instead? I'll probably be involved like in something like law enforcement, military type of thing. Nice. Cool. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. And then final question for the pummel game. Uh, if a zombie apocalypse happens right now, what's the first thing you do? First thing I'll do, I'll suit up from, uh, from, I uh, open my safe. Let's suit up. <laughs> there you go. You're ready. <laughs> Holes is ready to go, man. All right. He's ready to go. Ready. He's like, yeah. Dude, I, I can just picture you like skydiving and shooting up zombies below. You, you'd be you'd be an there excellent person on the on the zombie apocalypse team. <laughs> you got to you got the go. jujitsu, the skydiving, and you can suit up. You're yeah. good to go. We had we had we had a pretty disappointing zombie apocalypse in 2020. Yeah, I know, right? man. It didn't pan out like I thought. I thought I thought it was going to go in the, in the direction of like zombie warfare, but it never never went that way. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and, uh, and and Holis, that was the final question for the pummel game. Congratulations, you win. You got your double underhooks. So Holis, let me ask you, man. Uh, for, for for students out there that we we talked about the idea of um, you know a lot of students initially start to just to learn jujitsu, then they find themselves uh, competing. They find themselves moving more towards like a teaching role. Something interesting that can happen kind of midway between those steps too is is old is uh, advanced ranks becoming mentors to lower belts. Um, what, what advice would you give to someone that's maybe like coming up in the ranks, maybe a new purple belt who finds themselves kind of helping lower ranks, helping white belts, helping new blue belts? Uh, what what advice would you give them to be an effective mentor to a less to a lower rank? All right, I think this is very important. Uh, don't be afraid. To say, I don't have an answer to that. Let's seek further uh, 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 information. Let's ask the somebody else. Excellent. Yeah. 
And there's no shame in saying that. The students are going to respect you a lot more if you say that than it give him like a, I don't know, a BS answer. When you were coming up in the ranks, did, did you find yourself learning from a lot of higher rank? Like when you were training with your family members and, and other people in the academy, did you learn a tremendous amount of jujitsu from people that were not black belts early on? Yes, it's, it's uh, you know, especially back in Brazil, it was very common, uh, I mean, after the training sessions, because when I was training at uh, Gracie Bar back then, uh, it was, man, it was it wasn't real, like real instruction. You know, like you get there, like you roll, you roll, you roll, you roll. And then at the end of the session, like, you know, some guys will stick around, will share knowledge. Hey, man, you know, show me that uh, that sweep that you did on me. You know, how do you do it? How, how can we block this? You know, so we like we keep studying. We call this like a, like a jujitsu lab, right? Studying and seeing, like testing things, okay? Or sometimes, you know, a guy was going to compete against somebody else and this was like before, like YouTube, internet days. And we had to try to mimic what the other person was doing to try to come up with like a solutions for the problem. So, yeah, so we learned from each other a lot like that. Experimenting, like trial and error. Yeah, it's, it's cool that you say that because that's very much been my experience as well. I, I can accredit a lot of the jujitsu and a lot of the knowledge that I've acquired to people that were not actual instructors and actual black belts. It's just like, you know, the tougher brown belt in the room or like the... The, 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 the purple belt that competes a lot. He saw something I did and corrected me or helped me along the way. So it, it's neat how some, I think sometimes yep. when you're, when you're a new student, you might not understand that there's a lot of people in the room that you can learn from. You don't have to necessarily only tag along with your instructor. There's other people that your instructor has already given a lot of knowledge to that can hand that to you as well. So it's uh, it's, yes. it's cool to know that when you're coming up, if you could give yourself, uh, if you could give white belt holist advice, what, what would be one piece of advice you would say to yourself if you could go back in time? Man, that'll be a tough one because I don't remember myself. That's as a true. White you're belt. probably like a very, a very <laughs> little kid. Yeah, you're, yeah, I forget. Which family are you from again? Yeah. You guys, don't, don't you guys like start in diapers? Oh, uh, uh, man, but like if I had the advice I would give to, uh, 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 to any white belt, it's like just uh, trust the process, trust the instructor, you know? follow what they say because if at first you cannot you can you cannot execute the move the second time you try do the way your instructor told you <laughs> that's very good that's very solid <laughs> advice that's that's that, that's what we call uh timeless <laughs> advice yeah it always it'll always work uh holis let me ask you man you you have a great instructional with us here at bjjfanatics.com it's called gracie adventure and it was it was actually one of the few instructionals that we have that's a uh seminar that was filmed it was you and your brothers uh man tell us about yes. that tell, tell us about what 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 uh what all you guys covered in that instructional and what you think people can get from it if they decide to check it out Man, it's like it's. I think that the, the instructional is good because you're gonna get a lot of us, right? And like, and and I think, uh, and the way we did it, we go by uh, by theme each year, each uh, uh, day during the the camp. It was actually during a camp that we do like the the Grace Adventure Camp. Uh, so each day or class of the camp, we have a theme. So we get like various different things, and depending on the, the instructor too, right? So we get myself, we get Igor, Gregor in there. Roger is in there, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, have a couple of guest instructors as well, so like it's 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 good material, you know. It's like it's a different uh, 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 way they shot it, you know. It's like not like a studio type of uh, 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 setup, but you can get a lot of information from and you know from the from the moves that uh, that we talk. Yeah, I thought I thought it was really cool. It's it a really unique uh, way to way to see an instructional. Like usually, like you said, with an, with our instructionals, it's it's in a studio setting. It's the instructor with an uki talking to the camera. This one was cool because it was just kind of following you guys around as you're teaching people, and then it would yeah. stop. To, it feels like you're at a seminar. It feels like you're just exactly. digital, yeah, yeah, like re remotely at a seminar. Which was it's really an immersive, cool. immersive DVD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if, you pull, if you pull like uh, the 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 three D uh, the Apple glasses. Like goggles. Yeah, exactly. Like the app. You're going to feel that you're there. And a, lot, and a lot cheaper to go to the camp. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you save a lot of money for sure. Yeah. Well, guys, if, you, if you're interested in checking it out, it is a very unique and interesting instructional. And they, there's a lot of great content in it. It's called Gracie Adventure. And it's available right now at bjjfanatics.com. So check that out. 
Uh, Holis, in closing, man, what are some major things you uh, hope to accomplish this year? What are your big goals for 2024? Man, I wanna I wanna grow my because uh, I opened my school year in uh, uh, in Florida last year. I'm gonna like in June at the end of June, we're gonna make uh, be a, a one year anniversary, right? So my I'm I'm focused on building that, growing that school, you know, uh, grow my roots here in Florida, and uh, see where it leads, or you know, branch out uh, or open like a second location eventually, like you know, maybe next year. But I definitely want to definitely the 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 goal is to grow this this location here. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Holis, it is always a pleasure and an honor to get to talk with you, sir. I appreciate you taking time to be on the show again for the second time. Uh, you always bring great content to the table. It's always really appreciated, and you're welcome back anytime you'd like to come back in the future. Thank you, bro. It was awesome. You know, time flew, and uh, yeah, it was amazing. Excellent. Excellent. I'm happy you had a good time. For anyone out there that wants to keep up with Holis, it's really easy to do so. He's active on Facebook. You can follow him there. He's also very active on Instagram. It's just Holis Gracie on all, all social media platforms. Yeah. Uh, he's also uh, got his website, holisgracieacademy.com. If you guys are ever traveling through New Jersey or through Florida, uh, he's got an, an academy in both of those places. If you guys are ever traveling through uh, Florida, he has an, an outstanding academy outside of Orlando, Lake Mary, Florida. Uh, make sure you guys drop in, get some training. And then if you're ever traveling through New Jersey, he's got an academy in Old Bridge, New Jersey. So you can drop in and train there. Uh, if for whatever reason you can't pass through and, and drop into one of his schools, you can learn from Holis anywhere in the world here at BJJFanatics.com. He's got a great instructional with us we talked about today called Gracie Adventure, which was a live, uh, which was a filmed seminar that he did. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, and uh, Holis, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you, brother. Excellent. That's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics Podcast.